Well, it would appear that at least one piece of the puzzle has fallen into place, as news has broken that the CEO of Wizards of the Coast, Cynthia Williams, has resigned, and the TTRPG podcast world and YouTube world is all a flitter with all kinds of wonderful information on that. It's Daniel with Driving and Dragons, and today we're going to talk about, well, Cynthia Williams. Of course, we're also going to talk about a few other things, some updates I've got on the Cyber City Dodge game that I've been working on. I've decided how I'm going to do my attributes, and I've got some ideas on character rolling that I'd love some input on. And on the 280ZX, we will finish the installation of the master cylinder, and it is entirely possible move on to replacing the clutch lines in this video. There will be quite a bit of clutch line replacement videos. Um, replacing that line was a colossal pain in the butt. But, hey, that's what it takes to restore these old sports cars, to get something cool and clean to drive around that you can really enjoy, something you put together with your own hands. I recommend that anybody who can do it, it doesn't have to be radically expensive. There are inexpensive vehicles out there that you can put in your garage or in your driveway and do minimal work to. Just do some research and don't you know get in over your head. But it's definitely something that can. Uh, it's almost a dying art form as a lot of us have run away from it. But there's a there's a certain, I guess you could say, romantic quality to having something nice that you can be proud of that you brought back to life yourself. Anyway, so moving on. Let's talk about Cynthia Williams. Just about everybody. Professor DM, Bob World Builder, the RPG Pundit, Diversity in Dragons, Tankard's Tavern, the OGGM. All of them coming out to express some thoughts and opinions on Cynthia Williams, who is departing Hasbro as the uh, CEO of Wizards of the Coast has handed in her resignation. And plenty of them are right and plenty of them are wrong, and most of them have a little bit right and a little bit wrong across the board. I think one of the funniest things was Bob World Builder, and I like Bob. I like his channel. I like a lot of the information that he's put out, but it's become increasingly obvious over the past year or so that he has got some, some heavy Wizards of the Coast Dungeons and Dragons shill hood built into him. Um, he may even be kind of close on the lines of what Pundit mentioned in his video as one of these custom-built TT, quote-unquote TTRPG um, YouTubers that was kind of propagated and pushed behind the scenes by Wizards. I don't think he quite is in that camp, but he was one of the ones that was invited up to the the big we're sorry we suck party that they had in Seattle after the OGL scandal where they tried to basically buy off a bunch of YouTubers with some swag and some hellos. But I think it's hilarious that he completely missed as he was reading through the article that announced Cynthia Williams' departure. He didn't realize that there were activist investors who had initiated a, an attempt to spin Wizards of the Coast off and sell it. And I'm like, how are you so deep in the TTRPG world and paying attention to Wizards and all this stuff and you missed that part? That was probably the most significant business happening during Cynthia Williams' tenure is that her screw-ups and the screw-ups that happened in the C-suite at Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro were so bad that one of their major shareholders and investment group more or less tried to force them to spin off Wizards of the Coast and then sell it whole cloth to somebody else to more or less bolster... Hasbro and gain some measure of control back. I mean, that was that was way bigger than OGL scandals, Pinkertons, shitty books, diversity hires, or any of that stuff. Of course, Bob missed that. But let's go down the, the line here. I'm not going to try and talk about every single other YouTuber's videos, all the different things Pundit said, all the stuff Double D said. I mean, his live stream, I think, was a couple hours at least. A lot to go through there, but here's the thing. When a CEO resigns, especially when a CEO resigns 
right about the exact same time the quarterly earnings reports are coming out showing that they are a miserable failure on the just the terms of what they're returning to the shareholders, that's a firing. Cynthia Williams was fired. You, it's just CEOs don't typically get fired. They're asked to resign. It's, it's too important a position that has too many irons in the fire, too much control, and too many responsibilities to just cut the head off and then try and you know, run without for a while while you're trying to replace them. But she was let go. And rightfully so. I can't think of anything Wizards of the Coast has done right since she took over. But she's also not the only one. There's a lot of people celebrating about it, and it's like, this is not what you think. People have trouble with scale. It's kind of like when you start talking about multi-billionaires. They can't grasp the scale of just how rich a person who is a true billionaire is and why the basic rules of money that billionaires and even people that are hundred millionaires follow don't work for them on the lower scale because they're not playing the same game by the same rules. And this is not some, oh, the rich have the game rigged nonsense. It's just when you get to that kind of scale, you have to understand certain things. If Elon Musk decides today that he wants to buy an entire dealership of Ferraris and you see him spend that money, as a percentage of his net worth, he is spending, it's like you or I going and buying a nice steak dinner at, the, at a chain restaurant, like a Longhorn or an Outback or something. It's not a significant expenditure. If he buys a Ferrari, as a financial guru Dave Ramsey would say, him buying a Ferrari is the financial equivalent to you going to Chick-fil-A and buying a biscuit in the drive through for breakfast. The same thing kind of happens when you look at C-suite level executives of large public corporations. We tend to think of, oh, you're firing the CEO. That's kind of like the guy who runs the HVAC company over here, the, you know, him getting fired, who's in the day-to-day -day of everything. The guy who owns the construction company, who runs to all the different job sites and runs all the houses that are being built and, you know, gives the supervisors their marching orders. He got fired. That is not what replacing a C-suite level exec is. Cynthia Williams is not going down there and saying, well, this is what we're going to put in the new Deck of Many Things companion book. She probably doesn't even know what the Deck of Many Things companion book is. She has gone to a supervisor under her with directives for where she, the overall direction. And she's three or four steps above the guy who's making direct decisions about what is going into a book, what's not going into a book, how a mechanic works, how a mechanic doesn't work. And just so you know, a good C-suite executive doesn't necessarily need to have a working knowledge of how the product that they move works. I know that sounds kind of stupid, like, oh my God, you brought in a CEO for Ford who knows nothing about how cars run or what goes into the design of a new sports car. Yes, because what a C-suite executive's job is, is to run a company, not to necessarily run products. Now, they have to provide some direction. They have to provide some directive for how they're going to overall monetize the company. In Cynthia Williams' case, it was about trying to focus on ways to monetize the player base as opposed to just the game masters trying to move into a digital format that would cut down costs and trying to exercise the licensing arm to produce other medium to uh, media to create more verticals for the company. But she's not greenlighting scripts on a movie. She's not going down and talking about you know what season four of the TV show is going to be if they had a TV show. She's not dealing with critical role in Darrington Press and any kind of licensing deal there. There are people under her that are doing that. So these people who are like, oh my God, Cynthia Williams is gone. Now Wizards of the Coast is going to be great again. No, there's a lot more heads on that Hydra that need to go away. For one, there's a head above her that needs to go away. Chris Cox needs to go. If you want to see anything really significant change down the line. But you need Kyle Brinks to be gotten rid of. You need Mackenzie DeArmond to be gotten rid of. 
You need your Connie Chungs to be gotten rid of. You need all of these people who are in the directive office, two and three levels down from the C-suite, that are making the, the hiring decisions to bring in the writers who are creating this media. They are the ones who have to go away to salvage this product. Especially if you're trying to get rid of the woke influence. That scale is so far beneath her, it's not even funny. Sure, she's going to have some directives like, hey, we're going to push social equity and we're going to avoid things that might be offensive to certain uh, certain social sensitivities. Like we're not going to, you know, we're going to pander to the gays. We're going to pander to the disabled. We're going to pander to the, you know, make-believe mental illness crowd, the self-diagnosed whatevers. But she's not going to make those direct decisions. That's the people that are underneath them. And just putting another person in, in charge is going to do more of the same stuff, just in a different way. And they'll try to book it. They'll sell it as a new direction and all kinds of other stuff. The CEO will come in and puff their chest out and talk about how they're going to drive the ship and correct things. And they're going to listen to the, the, the real customers and the core player base and stuff. And they're going to do the same kind of stuff. They're going to issue large, overreaching blanket directives from the top. And then they're going to focus on things like the logistics department that delivers the magic cards and the books out to the different stores, the large major licensing deals to make sure that Amazon and Target and Best Buy and uh, Barnes and Noble and all these other companies have their things. They're going to work at their, their publishing arm and whether or not they need to go back into trying to get outside publishing to handle the production as opposed to publishing in-house. All these things that TTRPG players don't even think about, don't care about, and certainly aren't going to see any controversy over. They're going to go back into looking at what is the best way to try and monetize players without being so stupid as to come out and say it directly. Um, that was really one of Cynthia Williams' big problems, is that she said the quiet part out loud, and she did it at a time when everybody was hyper-focused on them, because they had done stupid stuff that really, really brought the ire of the media arm, the, that invisible media arm of the company, which is all the YouTubers and Twitch streamers um, and bloggers and pundits and whatnot out there that are not associated with Wizards, but are associated with the hobby itself. So, like I said, there's there's a lot to be looked at out there um, when it comes to uh, Cynthia Williams. It's not some great win that she's gone. It's not some great change in direction. You still have a lot of other pieces, a lot of other rats that need to be gotten out of that basement if you ever want to see Wizards of the Coast make any kind of turn. And to be honest, I'm not sure it'll ever happen because this is not just rot from the core that has more or less killed Wizards of the Coast. Wizards of the Coast was kind of rotten from the beginning. I mean, even going back into the 90s, this has always been the type of people who've populated the creative halls of Wizards of the Coast. But let's go ahead and be optimistic. Keep our eyes open. Who knows? Maybe we'll see Mackenzie and her ilk out on their ass. Maybe we'll see Kyle Branks uh, being the first straight white male to be gone from the hobby. Um, not by choice, of course. We'll see what happens. All right, so let's move on to a couple other things here. I'm going to talk about Cyber City Dodge for a minute. This is the D30 system that I've been developing for my own game and working on. I'm running a game that is predominantly using the D6, the D12, and the D30. A high lethality skill-based system with no levels that uh, borrows some from games like Cyberpunk 2020, Cyberpunk Red, borrows some from things like Dungeons & Dragons, and uses other influences to kind of make things a little less swingy and to give some simulationism while maintaining the feel of a fantasy or a high sci-fi style game that still has engaging play. And what I want to talk about here is the abilities and attributes that I've chosen to go with. I've chosen to go with four physical attributes and four mental attributes Strength, agility, reflexes, and vitality on the physical side. Intellect, resilience, awareness, and presence on the mental or metaphysical side. And essentially what I've got is the ones, you know, we got the obvious ones. Strength, intellect, vitality. These are awareness. These are the real obvious ones. 
I've separated agility and reflexes. Agility, and this is not anything new and or anything groundbreaking, but essentially agility is that physical dexterity, that ability to move in space, that ability to control, you know, have fine motor control and precision. Whereas reflexes is that ability to respond quickly. It, it's almost a more, one is a more autonomic response, reflexes. One is a more active and you know high function response, agility. That's really the separation of those two, which gives me the ability to have somebody who can react quickly, but is still kind of clumsy. Or somebody who can sit there and spin a knife through their fingers and stuff, but is just slow to react. And then I've gone into the intellectual side of things. I've, I've gone with presence. And the reason I've gone with presence is I, di- I don't like charisma. I think it sends the wrong idea to the player. Because everybody thinks of charisma. They think of the physically attractive, everybody likes them, easy to speak to, smooth talk. But that's not the only way to influence others, especially in these kind of games. So presence is just their force of personality. Whether that translates into intimidation or the ability to terrify others, whether it's the ability to just suck all the oxygen out of the room and have everybody listen to you, or it's the ability to smooth talk and you know slither through a social situation, it's all about your presence. And then, of course, uh, resilience is kind of like the mental side of constitution. Your resilience is your ability, the, the ability to tough it out and push forward. I've taken HP, your hit points, and made them a function of vitality and resolve. So it's not just your physical vitality, it's also your mental ability to push forward and move on that goes into your hit points. So you can have somebody who's maybe not physically the strongest, maybe doesn't have that deep ability to fight off disease and handle injury and stuff, but they've got that that never-say-die attitude where you just keep beating them and beating them down and they keep coming back because they're just not going to quit. And then you can also have the other side where you have that guy who's big and tough and strong but doesn't really handle pain and doesn't handle adversity well and you know kind of wants to quit early. With both of those factoring into hit points, you can have that situation where this guy may be big and physically tough and have a great constitution, but he gets shot and it all goes out the window as a function of his resolve. So he's now down in the lower hit points. Whereas you can, like I said, also have that guy who may be kind of scrawny and weak in a way and his body is going to give out on him pretty easy, but he's, he's got the mental toughness reflected in his hit points as well. And then I've kind of replaced what would be the Dungeons and Dragons initiative system with a ability called instinct. And instinct is a combination of awareness, the ability to see what's going on around you, recognize your surroundings, and reflexes, which is, like I said, that autonomic response to stimulus, using them as just a combination. Maxing out stats at 18 for a normal individual, like that's your max base stat, maxing out your ability to go above and beyond that at 20 with cybernetics and other things that are found in the game. But now we get to how you, how do you roll those statistics? First off, a little side note on the way I'm using attributes. I'm using a direct roll. Your attribute, if you have a 10 strength and you roll a a skill related to strength, you add 10 to it. There's no bonus system. It's not 10 is plus 1 and 11 is plus 2 or any of that nonsense. Straight and simple to the point, you add your attribute to your roll. I've got the attributes broken into two sets. Genetic attributes and and experiential attributes. So you'll start by rolling straight down the line in order, strength, agility, reflex, vitality, intellect, resolve, awareness, presence, you roll a D12 for each one, giving you a number from 1 to 12. That is your genetic makeup. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a guy who had probably a 10, 11, or 12 strength. He was born genetically gifted to build his body and have that strength. Now, he did more to take himself to a much higher level 
but he started with those high genetics. Just like you're going to have people who start off life with a one or two, they can bust their butt in the gym all they want to, but their strength is only going to, you know, their strength is starting from a very low level. And it would take a tremendous amount of effort for them. You know, many orders of magnitude more effort than it took Arnold Schwarzenegger to get to the Olympia. That guy who's starting with the two strength is going to have an order, many orders of magnitude more than he has to go through to get to that Olympia level which is where we go to the experiential attributes. This is where it gives the player more control. You're rolling down the line, you got that four strength, and you really don't like that. Well, that's okay because based on varying difficulty set by the game master, either 8D3s, 8D6, or 8D6 plus 16 are your, exp uh, your experiential stat pool. So let's just, for instance, say you had an average roll on a standard game. So you got a low power game, a standard game, a high power game. Let's say it's a standard game. You roll your 8d6, you get 24 points. Those 24 points, you get to assign however you want to, to all eight different, stati uh, all eight different attributes up to an 18. These represent the things that your character has done throughout their life to get better at whatever it is they want to do. So for instance, if you had a character who you said was a bookworm, extra dedicated to their studies, spent a lot of time trying to get their hands on whatever books or old computer files or stuff they could find to read about any given type of subject, you could say, well, okay, well, they put six of my points into intelligence or into intellect to reflect that. So you get a situation where you get to balance out that simulationism that a lot of our BECME and OSR guys really want that you don't get to choose type deal because these are, here's your genetic role, but you still get to have some of that customization to reflect what your life experiences as a character were. To me, I think that actually adds another level of simulationism. And I think it also kind of helps with backstory too, because now you can work your backstory into the game directly by reflecting those impacts um, and those effects on your character in your stat roles and the way your distribution is. So everybody, please give me some insight down in the comment section below. I'm really looking forward to put this together. I'm going to need some very, very early quote unquote alpha play testers at some point to take this system and kind of run some encounters and stuff with it to see how things kind of balance out. I'm going to need some people to roll characters and see how the character rolls work out to make sure that I've got the right, especially on the experiential points. I really need to make sure that's balanced. I don't want a situation where it's like nine times out of 10, even though mathematically it shouldn't really happen that way, but nine times out of 10, every time you run a high powered game, you got people running around with four five and six 18s uh, right off the bat regardless of what their um what their genetic roles are and i you know also want to make sure that that kind of gives me those solid averages the way uh the numbers tell me they should anyway so that's what i've got on cynthia williams and her departure and on the cyber city dodge rule system idea update here like share subscribe and i hope to see you guys next time